South Africa is our family's 23rd country after three years of constant travel. And we've kicked off our Rainbow Nation tour here in Johannesburg, also known as Joburg or Josie. With so much diverse culture and rich history to discover, we're hiring a local guide and a private driver for the day so that we can explore the city efficiently before heading into the remote bush for back-to-back -back safaris. Let's get to it. We're the Lockwoods, and we're traveling the world to experience up close and in person all the natural wonders and distinct cultures that our kids would otherwise see only in textbooks and TV. Now we are leaving our hotel. We've been staying at the Marriott in Melrose Arch, and we've got a private guide arranged by them for the whole day, and we're starting right now. This is our guide, Mdu, and he's gonna be with us, telling us everything about Johannesburg. Welcome, welcome. Hi, are you our driver? Yes. And what's your name? My name is Majaji. Majaji? Majaji. Yes. Majaji. 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 Our first stop is impromptu, because we got talking in the van, and we saw this housing development over here. They're called shanties, which means shack. And there's a lot of rich history in Johannesburg, and we'll get to that later. But there's also a lot of really dark history. We're learning about an event that happened in 1976. A lot of students were upset about the education that they were getting, so they created a memorandum and decided to march to the stadium and hand over the document to peacefully protest. But the police came and they started throwing tear gas at them, but because of the wind, it blew back in their face. So they released dogs on the children. The kids only means of defense were stones and they threw stones at the dog and the dog died. So the police started shooting at the children and it was a horrible event in their history. But a lot of protests across the whole country came from that event. And this is just a small part of the history and the culture that has led to where South Africa is today. So we have so much more to learn. Let's get going. Welcome, loved it. So that was a little bit of their history and their culture, but those are people who haven't been able to find employment and they wanna find a positive, constructive way to make some money and be a positive part of the community, which is awesome. So we, when you see a dance like that, you wanna give them a donation. But we are here on Via Kazi Street and it is one of the more popular touristy areas in Su 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 Suwatu. Yeah, it's Soweto. And an easy way to remember it is it's really just an abbreviation for Southwest Township, Soweto. Now, no introduction to South Africa or Johannesburg would be complete without at least touching on the subject of apartheid, and no discussion of apartheid would be appropriate without mentioning Nelson Mandela. We are here in front of Nelson Mandela's house. Apartheid, which means aparthood or separateness, was a system of institutionalized segregation, racial segregation that existed in South Africa from 1948 until the early 1990s. And one of the key activists against this system was Nelson Mandela. He started off as an attorney. Mandela lived right here in this home prior to when he was imprisoned in the year 1978, and he spent 27 years in prison before he returned to this home for all of 11 days before finally moving away. This is a one-bedroom house that he originally owned with his first wife, Evelyn. But since they had four children together and his second wife, Winnie, they had two children together, they turned it into a two-bedroom home and they turned the living area into the kids' bedroom. Now there are several bullet holes on the outside of the home because the police would come and attack the house. They had to build a brick wall in the kitchen so that they had an extra layer of protection to put the children behind when the police came and attacked. Did you catch that part? Did you see the bullet holes? Brooklyn? Yeah. Mm. That was interesting. Can you imagine? Terrifying. And there's a lot of significance on the outside of the home too. This tree, uh, Mandela planted it himself. It, he imported it from Australia and they planted all of their children's umbilical cords. It's an African tradition. It's to symbolize the connection and to build a connection to the, the home and the property 
from the children that were born here. And these bars, these bars were put here when they made it a museum to represent his imprisonment. On Robben Island, which is right off the coast of Cape Town, the city we're going to next. Oh, we have a really big correction to make. So this really nice gentleman trying to sell us a hat, we're gonna have to get Colt a hat now because he is giving us so much great information. The umbilical cords were planted to represent the children connecting with their ancestors. Is that good? Introduce the to the ancestors, go. telling the ancestors that okay. we have a new member in the family by not throwing the umbilical cord and yeah. planting it over there. Okay. It is to introduce the babies to the ancestors. Yes! Telling the ancestors that they have a new member of the family. Now Nelson Mandela was released from prison in 1990 and then in 1994 became the first democratically elected black president of South Africa. And in 1998, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Although here's an interesting tidbit. He's not the only resident from this street to win the Nobel Peace Prize because there was also Archbishop Desmond Tutu who played a very important role in peaceful protest during the apartheid era. This street holds even more significance and it takes us back to the original story I told you about the children marching and ended up having a mass shooting. They started right there at that school and they marched up this street. And there is a museum up here, the Hector Peterson Museum, that is a memorial for one of the youngest children who died in that shooting. Not the youngest, the youngest is an eight-year-old girl. But Hector, Hector was 12 years old when he, <laughs> One second. Hector was 12 years old when he sh was shot that day. The same age as Brooklyn. <laughs> I can't, babe. I can't. And this metal art represents the scene of the policeman releasing the dog onto the children. The catalyst that started the whole thing. I am not going to be able to get through this without getting emotional. As a mom and, and as a human, we're at ground zero where the shooting happened. and. It's also the Hector Peterson Memorial and Museum. And they chose Hector as the representative for this event because of this photo right here. Out of the 15 to 20,000 kids that, and it was predominantly children uh, that were doing this march, it was one of the first of seven to 800 kids that were shot and killed that day. And this photo is the first photo of a, a child being shot that was taken and they tried to confiscate the photographer's camera but he shoved the film in his sock. And the next day he was able to print the photo and publish it out. Um, and it reached the whole world. And it started not just a, a movement across the country, but a, a movement across the world uh, because the police wanted to contain the information about what had happened here. And once that photo came out, they couldn't do that. So that's why Hector was chosen to be the representative. Stonewall represents the children of the march standing in solidarity. And the gaps in between represent the children who were shot and killed. And the different heights for the wall represent the different ages for the kids. Now this little reflecting pond represents the flow of blood from all of the killings. And then the stones represent the only weapon that those children had that day. It's really tough for anybody to take in, so I think we're going to take a little break, hit lunch, recuperate. Sakumzi restaurant, authentic Soweto cuisine. Just what we're looking for. And it's an African buffet! Nothing like a buffet to turn my mood around. Yeah, Let's get real food first. Uh, this is actually the wrong side for today. They switched it up. We're gonna find our food elsewhere. So we're going through here. We had some of this yesterday. I believe these are called dumplings, which is very similar to bread. And here in front of a colt is pop. And it's uh, it's, a, it's ground maize and uh, you use your fingers and uh, make a little hole and just pinch your food with it and eat with your hands. And the brown one in front of it is, um, it's ting, yes, which yeah. is like the pop. Now this has plastic wrap on it because they don't want it to stick. Okay guys, are you guys doing okay? And it works great. Still all right? yeah. okay. And we've got some samp and beans, spicy rice, 
tomato gravy. I would say that all of these are what we had in last night's episode, and then pretty much everything here is new. That's not true. We had a couple of these things last night also. If you haven't seen our episode where we do the African tastes tour throughout Yeovil, definitely check that one out. No clue what meat is in here. No clue at all whatsoever, and it's a little jiggly, and I wonder if maybe there's tripe in it. Sausage, it's really good. I'm down with round one and I'm going in for round two. And I'm just gonna start on round one. I don't know if I can make it to round two because there's so much food here. I am so excited to eat with my hands again. I take the grain, make it a little ball, put my thumb in it to make a little hole, and then I use it like a scoop to pick up the meat. And that's how you do it in Africa. I'm back from round two and I got some other interesting things to try. This is pop. This is a potato salad. I believe this is beet. I'm not sure though. Never had it before. Tastes like beet pop. They have these signs on the picnic tables here for this Tanqueray Black Currant Royale, and it looked pretty amazing. So I ordered one of those up. Look at that. Tanqueray glasses. Purple color from the black currant. Gonna add our rocks, a little club soda, stir it up, and drink it up. Wow, oh, that's really good, especially on a warm day like this. I got strawberry ice cream. I got the famous South African dessert, malva pudding. And this dish is one of many recommendations we got from new friends and fellow travel bloggers, Chev and Dev. But I'm not sure what is in malva pudding, so I've gotta Google that. And this brings up an interesting challenge that we have when traveling. Our mobile data plans from our US carrier aren't really great when we're traveling outside of North America. We hear all about these really cheap SIM cards that people can get when traveling internationally, but we've got the brand new iPhones that are US based, so we don't even have physical SIM ports in there. But I heard about YesSIM, which is a mobile app that uses eSIM technology, so it's perfect for most phones. We'll include a download link in the description, but all we did was go to the app store and search for YesSIM, and then we downloaded and installed the app. But for people who travel like us and go out exploring, we need cellular data, because we need maps and directions, looking up historical facts, looking up recipes or ingredients. Don't forget Pokemon Go! and my music streaming. Now what we had been doing was just paying our mobile carrier when we would travel for all of the overages, but that was literally costing us up to an additional $300 a month. That's on top of our normal plan, not sustainable. So YesM covers us in basically every place we're traveling. The EU, CIS, South America, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, even North America when we're traveling to those countries that are outside of our primary plan. It's something like 125 countries in all. Since we're in Johannesburg this month, I just click on internet, then find South Africa. So I'm just gonna search. And then I can see my options for total data and time frame. We're here for a couple of weeks, so I'm gonna pick the five gigabyte option for 15 days. Now these prices vary depending on the country, by the way. You can pay via credit card, crypto, or mobile payments, but since I already have Y coins, which are their loyalty currency, I'll just use those to pay this time. Mostly I love that we don't have to go shopping for physical SIM cards whenever we visit a new country. I can just pull up the SM app as soon as we land, and then I get connected. Oh, and they're now offering virtual phone numbers, but only for a few countries so far. This would be super handy for us in the Philippines, but that one's not covered yet. But if you need a virtual phone number, I think they're currently supporting the US, Canada, Netherlands, and Israel. We'll definitely include an app download link at the top of the description. And if you travel a lot and have the same data challenge as we do, we definitely suggest that you download and install it now so you don't forget later. But use promo code always be changing and let us know what you think. I'm gonna tell you what I think of this malva pudding now because I know what's in it. It's apricot jam. So the base is kind of like an apricot jam bread pudding, and the top is like a vanilla custard. Jeb and Dev are right. This is so delicious. Wow, the custard tastes like um, like a marshmallow vanilla-y cloud. And then the bread pudding on the bottom is just moist and delicious, and I love the apricot flavor. I think the world needs to know about malva pudding. This is as good as they said it was. Cole, you want a bite? It's I mean, so good. Mmm, yeah. that's interesting. Is it good? Yeah, it tastes like cereal. Cereal, huh? I don't know. Let's get out of here and tell the world about malva pudding. Go to my backpack, we'll make it through. Barely. 
These are the Orlando Twin Towers, and they are decommissioned coal power stations. And I have to say, I've never been next to power stations like this, nuclear power plants, or anything else for that matter. They are way, way bigger than they look in pictures. I mean, these are literal skyscrapers, about 100 meters high, and get this, you can actually bungee jump from the bridge in between them. No thank you. There are a lot of things that the Lockwood family will do. We're very adventurous, but one thing that I have crossed off the list is bungee jumping. We won't do it anywhere in the world ever. They started construction in 1935. It took about 15 years to complete, so it went active in 1951 and was decommissioned in 2001. And the way it works from a very basic level, at least is my understanding, is there's a cauldron in the middle of each tower. That's where they would have conveyor belts, take the coal up there into the cauldron where it would be burned, and used to generate steam, which then generates electricity. Now what's interesting is, these towers were generating massive amounts of electricity, but none of it was used for people who live in this area. It was all taken into town. And now, of course, they might be some of the world's largest pieces of street art because they've been painted. This one is the Soweto Local Beer Company, and the one behind me is Vodacom, which is a mobile carrier for people who aren't smart enough to use YesSim. It's all concrete construction, and this like red track looking thing on the outside of that building, that's an elevator. And I'd say no thank you just to the elevator because I get super dizzy when we're at heights and that would terrify me. But that's how you get up if you did the bungee jumping. Place is really chill today because we're here basically in the middle of a Thursday, but on weekends it's hopping. It's a really cool social center. You can do everything from riding the quad ATVs around here to ponying up at the pub that's on site or doing the braai, which is the barbecue that we experienced in our previous episode. Again, be sure to check that out. And now that we're over here, we can see there's a rock climbing wall right over there. Back in the van. This is the Fort Hill Prison. That was an active prison from 1892 until 1983, and it was home to several notable prisoners, including Nelson and Winnie Mandela. For a little taste, so to speak, of what the dining conditions were like, this was one of the food dishes. They were almost never washed, so they were crusted with old food. This is an example of the portion size that the black prisoners would get. And on Christmas Day, this would be the cake that the white prisoners would get whereas black prisoners would get maybe a cup of tea or coffee. The prison was so filthy and a source of disease for a lot of the prisoners. Uh, many of them got typhoids and other outbreaks. They would have them uh, go to the bathroom outside these the toilet areas and everybody could see it be open to them. And they would let them clog and plug and overflow and come out here. And the purpose of that was so that they would lose their appetite and maybe not eat. In the showers for the black prisoners, had eight shower heads for 2,000 prisoners, and they only got to use them for 30 minutes total for 2,000 people, and that was once a week with one bar of soap to share amongst all of them. Obviously, you couldn't actually shower 2,000 people in 30 minutes, which meant people would just go months without showering. This room over here was for torturing prisoners, and the most extreme form of torture was flogging, and they would have a doctor present at these floggings. They would measure by the lashes and the depths of the cuts that they would make of how severe the punishment would be. And that was for the whole duration of the prison being open from the late 1890s to 1880s when it was finally closed. These are the isolation cells, again, for the black prisoners, and they are one prisoner per cell, almost no light in there once the door is closed and the little latches are closed. They would basically have two sleeping blankets in here and then two buckets. One would be to use as a bathroom and the other would be for the rice water, which was their food. So that was the only food that they would get the entire time. It's supposed to be a maximum of 30 days spent in isolation, but a lot of times these prisoners were kept in here for over a year. The obvious intent to be to get them to die one way or another through sickness, malnutrition, whatever it took to be oppressed. And they would have to spend 23 hours a day in that isolation, only one hour every day where they would be outside of that. This is one of the prison cells and it was supposed to have a maximum of 30 prisoners in here, but sometimes they would have up to 60 in here. And you can see the difference between what the white prisoners would get and what the non-white prisoners would get. Down here would be non-white prisoners where they would essentially get two sleeping mats and three blankets versus 
over here with the white prisoners where they would get two sleeping mats or a mattress and a pillow, three blankets, four sheets, two pillowcases, and a bedspread. When we first started learning about Nelson Mandela, I thought a lot of this sounds like Gandhi, that they first started off as lawyers and then became activists. And there's more similarity. Gandhi was imprisoned here as well. He was here in 1908. Mandela was here in 1956 and 62, but only for a few weeks. And they kept him on the white prisoner's side. And there are a few theories as to why. One of them is political, that he would incite the, the mass prisoners on the black side. And the other theory was that they could spot him easier amongst the white prisoners so that he wouldn't be able to escape as easily if he ever wanted to try. So Nelson Mandela's second incarceration here in 1962 that Aaron was talking about, where he was in the white section, it was actually in this hospital ward right here, so this was his room. He only stayed here for a few weeks until he was transferred to Pretoria to stand trial. Really heavy stuff, really heavy history, but let's talk about the progress. It all leads to where South Africa is now. And we're in the middle of Constitution Hill. This prison is no longer a prison, obviously. It's more of a museum, a memorandum of what had happened there so that we can learn from it. And the Constitutional Court right over there is where they have the new documents that they signed for their new constitution. So change is happening. I don't think it's perfect, but it's on its way. And we're bringing it back full circle. We're back in Melrose Arch. And remember when I said that Johannesburg also has a rich history? We are only 10 minutes away from Santon, which is the richest square mile in all of Africa, the continent. That's because Johannesburg is a hub for businesses that really started with the gold rush in 1886. This city was really built because of the gold rush. There is a vast difference between the wealthy and the poor in this country. And I know that this has been a very different tone to our episodes. We're usually having a lot of fun, a lot of smiles. There are a lot of serious things that we went over. And it's just as, if not more important than some of the fun things that we do. But with that said, our kids have been amazing all day long. And we want to reward them by going to Trampoline Park tomorrow. So we're taking a day off. And if you want to see what we do when we're not filming, you should follow us on Instagram. So be sure to like, follow, and subscribe so you don't miss any of our upcoming episodes. Thanks for watching. I can fit my entire fist into my mouth. Do you want to watch? No! Oh my gosh, she did it! No, don't do that. Look at me. <laughs> no, the thumb has to be in there too. No, what? don't do that. What talent we have. Why do you encourage this? <laughs> Yes. <laughs>